All right, good morning, everyone. It's so great to see everyone back in person. Um, I'm not going to give a lot of motivation or introduction. I think everyone knows why we are here. But I want to briefly start with um, our vision or uh, what we think um, how we can implement these systems. And I think we are at a stage where we can think about not only replacing individual models, but thinking about maybe changing the entire concept of how we develop drugs to a more human-centric, patient-centric way of using microphysiological systems embedded in, in silico um, and just using, um, let's say, the, 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 all the absolutely crucial animal models for PK studies, for example. Um, we did actually a, a, a fun brainstorm experiment l last year with Adrian and Rian, where we thought about how, how could this be implemented in a, in, let's say, in a way where we mitigate the risks that come with it. So if you're interested, uh, I uh, really strongly refer you to the perspective. But the other point I want to make um, before starting really with the sciences, um, we're talking a lot about pharmaceutical R&D and pharmaceutical development, and I think this is from a business case the, the correct thing to do because that's where everyone thinks there's the money. But um, looking at the number of, of animal studies run, I think um, basic biomedical research is the, the target where we really should try to implement our systems because this is really where most of the animal studies are run. So that's a, and, and another point I, I'm, I'd like everyone to, to remember, don't only focus on pharma. All right, so what, what are we doing? So in my, in my lab, we call ourselves the Microorgano lab, we try to develop um, organ and chip um, systems in a, let's say, a holistic way. So we don't distinguish dis uh, between engineering and biology. We try to really do it in an in a, um, integrative way. Um, and our idea is also that for any tissue and any um, purpose, we need uh, a specific model, a specific microenvironment. So we circle through the journey of an organ and chip model from our ideas through the different steps of the biology and engineering branch that are more in an iterative way then end with um, generating tissues in the end, establishing assays and readouts. I think this is one of the most crucial points um, before then going to a function validation um, and then going into the applications. Um, that way we have developed over the last um, couple of years a number of different organ ownership systems it's ranging from retina, maybe some of you heard uh, Madalena talk about our retina yesterday, um, all the way to, to adipose um, and are working on a, on a number of more models. But today I'm going to focus on um, one of the aspects we have been focusing quite a lot in the, in the last two years, actually, um, how to integrate immune aspects or how to integrate immune components in our systems. Um, and I don't think I have to give a lot of motivation. I think everyone is aware why modeling immune responses is um, extremely important. I think um, immune-mediated diseases are increasingly prevalent. I think everyone... Um, learn about this, this, this virus, this COVID thing um, going around um, where the immune system plays a major role, but also immunotherapies um, are on the rise and especially the immune system differs strongly between different species. So an animal responds to a pathogen very different than a, a human does. One of the key steps in, in um, getting immunocompetence in our models is the cell sourcing. Um, the way we do it, we use two different approaches. Um, we, uh, um, always start with a human. We get tissue biopsies and isolate tissue resident immune cells, use them in complete or sorted fraction and add them back into our systems. Or we use blood um, and isolate the circulating immune cells and again either sort them or put them in, um, in an undifferentiated or differentiated way in the systems. Um, sometimes we even combine these two things that we get from the same patient, the biopsies and the blood, but this is the, the, the way uh, which allows us to give uh, a toolbox of, of integrating the immune cells. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how, how we do it. I'm going to start with the, the adipose and chip system. I'm not going to talk much about it because hopefully everyone heard Julia's talk yesterday. If not, I think it's recorded. So if you want to know more about it, uh, um, you should check that out. But in our adipose system, we, we follow exactly that way what I, what I just described. Adipose tissue is um, an extremely complex system. Um, many people really don't regard adipose as an organ, but it is, in my view, maybe one of the most important organs. And it consists of, um, on the one hand, adipocytes, but on the other hand, also um, a lot of um, immune cells or um, a lot of stromal cells, um, the stromal vascular fractions, and obviously you also have um, the circulating immune cells from the vasculature. And so for the model, we do it like that. We isolate um, from a tissue biopsy or a skin biopsy the, the adipocytes in a, on the one hand. We also isolate the stromal vascular fraction where we can then um, get also the immune cells out. 
um, and we also isolate the endothelial cells. At the same time, we get blood, um, so we from the same patient, and here we can again isolate the PMMCs and then the T cells or the, the monocyte um, cells. And when you have all of these cells in an isolated fraction, we put them back together. So we use a, a, what we call a bottom-up assembly approach. Um, so we inject um, the adipocytes, the um, immune cells, um, into um, our chip and in our um, tissue compartment, which looks like that. It's a cylindrical compartment. Adipocytes really don't like edges, so we have a cylindrical compartment. We inject them in a mixture into this compartment and we add the endothelial cells on top, lining our channels, um, we're having an endothelial barrier, and then we can circulate, for example, the immune cells, the circulating immune cells through the channels and look at the recruitment. Um, the interesting part here is we, we can really have the, the adipose um, tissue macrophages, which have a very, very specific phenotype in the system, and we can have them um, functional viable in there in, in a 3D arrangement over um, multiple days and even weeks. So that's the, um, the, the bottom-up assembly allows us to now play around. So can we just take this cell out, or we, we only add these cells, we only add these cells, and we can do this in a, in a patient-specific way. So we can, from one patient, we can generate um, 50 different systems um, which have different compositions, and then we can look at what are the um, different cell types contributing to the tissue function. And this is actually very interesting because it's not just the superposition of the uh, function of the individual cell types that make the tissue um, uh, function. So, um, for example, looking at, at the adipokin levels, which are typically um, thought to be only produced by the adipocytes, if you have the adipocyte-only system, you can see that you have some secretion, but not much. Only in the full complexity system, where you have the immune cells, where you have the stromal cells, where you have the endothelial cells, you get um, actually a physiological level, a secretion. So it really shows you the interplay of the immune cells with the adipocytes and the stromal cells and the um, endothelial cells that makes up this tissue function. The same is, uh, um, is the case if we look at other um, cytokine levels. Here also, the, it obviously depends on if you have the immune cells in, but um, now the endothelial cells play actually a, a, a big role in, in, in reducing the, the cytokine levels that you find in um, your media. And that then indirectly also um, has an impact, for example, on the recruitment of T cells. So the complexity of the system uh, um, really gives you, um, uh, it defines the, the tissue function in the end. And now it, it's important to think about, okay, what is the function I want to replicate? What is the complexity of the system I need? All right, as promised, I'm not going to talk m much more about the adipose, um, but I'm going to jump directly to our, our next model, um, and this is the choroidon chip model. Our choroidon chip model, um, it's basically the, the outer blood retinal barrier um, in the eye, um, we have been working a lot on, on ophthalmology lately because um, especially anti-tumor drugs um, are, uh, have a, a lot of ocular side effects. So the choroid um, has, comprises an epithelium, and endothelium, and the stromal cells. The epithelium is a very um, defined um, retinal pigment epithelium, um, and the stromal cells are mostly melanocytes. And the coronal immune cells are critical for retinal homeostasis. Um, so that's how the system looks like. It's a three-channel chip. Um, and if we look at it from the side, we have the top channel, which is the retinal pigment epithelium. Here we use IPS-derived RPE. Then we have a perfusal central channel for the endothelium, and then a 3D channel in the lower compartment, or a melanocyte um, channel, where we inject melanocytes in hydrogel. And that's how it looks like. So this is the, um, the RPE, which um, forms nice um, tight junction throughout the entire channel um, length. Um, it is pigmented, and it um, shows a strong melanin production, which is also critical um, for a, a lot of um, functions. Then our central channel, we line with uh, microvascular endothelial cells that we isolate from um, skin biopsies. And the lower channel is um, uh, melanocytes embedded in a hydrogel. And here, again, this is a bottom-up approach. Um, what it allowed us was um, to play around with the density of the melanocytes, because our, our pharma partners were, um, who were working on that, and they were interested in having, on the one hand, a human-like system, and on the other hand, a system that mimics the, the pigmentation of, the, of a cyanologan monkey. So we generated two different models, one with a very low um, human-like, melanocyte density and one with a very high um, xeno-like um, melanocyte density. And this is uh, very interesting, and I'll, I'll get to that um, later because it also um, induced effects which we did not uh, expect. And then, last but not least, we could, again, perfuse T-cells or PBMCs in an activated or non-activated fashion and then look at the cytokine 
um, dynamics in the effluent and also look at the recruitment of these PBMCs into the, the melanocyte compartment. And um, I promised you I'm going to talk about a little bit about the role of the melanocytes. And here we could um, interestingly see that the density of the melanocytes has a strong impact on um, the cytokine release and also on the recruitment of the T cells. So we could see that the, the higher melanocyte density promoted the, um, the recruitment of PBMCs and most likely by, uh, by an increased L6 secretion. Um, and we could see that um, was mostly the case for, for the T cells. We could, see an overall increase of PBMCs, but mostly the, the T cell recruitment was, was increased. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's important to really consider the, the, the densities and the, the cell types you put in your system um, if you want to look at, at, at complex cascades. Okay, so what, what did we do with the, the system? Um, one of the first things we do, did, we looked into, can we um, study the response to immunomodulatory drugs? So we used um, the immunosuppressor cyclosporine A, and we, looked, um, we, we exposed the system um, to two different doses, a low and a high dose. I think it was 100 nanogram and, um, per mil and uh, 500 nanogram per mil. Um, and we could see that we um, see um, a reversion of the, the, the T cell activation, both at the cytokine and at the migration level, in a dose-dependent manner. So at a high dose, we could really see the, the cytokine um, secretion almost um, reduced to, to the control level, and we could see um, only um, a limited amount of, of T cell recruitment. Then we used the same system to look at um, uh, bi um, um, bispecific T cell indicators, TCBs. So we, we tested two different TCBs, um, um, and uh, we call it TCBA and TCBB, and we looked at their, um, um, within, uh, uh, their the recruitment of, of T cells due to the um, treatment with TCBs in the system, which you actually don't want. You don't want them, uh, the T cells to be activated and going into the, the choroidal compartment. You want them to go to the tumor. And what we could see is that for the two different TCBs, um, which um, I, I honestly don't know what they are, um, but we could see um, that there's a, a, strong, oh, um, a strong difference in terms of, there we are, in terms of um, cytokine um, um, uh, release. Um, and, uh, and T cell specific recruitment. So we could see that the, the T cells were recruited similarly, but the overall PBMC recruitment um, uh, differed strongly. So we saw the, the difference in, in, in cytokine release and also in the, in the type of cells that we recruited in our system. All right, so these are two examples of how you can use these, these um, immunocomponent systems to, um, for example, look at safety aspects, but also at efficacy aspects. And the third system I want to talk about is our cancer on chip system. And we heard now a lot about cancer, and we heard a lot about uh, T cells or CAR T cells, and I'm going to tell you, tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so we um, work on a, on a cancer on chip system to look at the efficacy and the safety of, of CAR T cell treatment. Um, initially, we were mostly interested in looking at um, how CAR T cell treatment um, or how it correlates to the cytokine release syndrome, but we then also moved more and more into the efficacy aspects. So this is how the, the model looks like. Um, it's a, a multi-layer system again. You have in the lower compartment two more chambers. Um, you then have a membrane, and then you have your, your, our, uh, the channel. That's how it looks. We can in, um, then inject breast cancer spheroids, or, um, and now we're working also on, on tumor organoids. Into the lower compartment, we can line the membrane with an endothelium um, uh, layer. And then we can perfuse the T cells or the CAR T cells, and here we're using RORUN CAR T cells from our collaborators in, in Würzburg, um, through the top compartment, and then look at um, a number of different endpoints. And one of the first things to look at was just the recruitment. Um, so this is, we, we labeled the T and the CAR T cells, and they're from the same donor, um, these cells. Um, we labeled them in, in red, and this is now um, focused on the, the compartment of the tumors. You can see that um, you have a few T cells um, that are uh, recruited, but very, very few, and you see a lot of them in out of focus um, flowing through the system. In the case of the CAR T cells, you can immediately see a much higher recruitment. But you, that is not limited to the recruitment. It also um, shows a, um, a strong impact on the, on the tumor growth. So in a, in a um, case of the T cells, we can still see the tumor grow over time. This is in uh, eight days. If we have the CAR T cells, you can see the, the picture looks, looks very different. So the tumor um, doesn't grow um, much anymore. Um, you can really see an, an inhibition of the, of the tumor growth by the, by the CAR T cells. 
And look, here we looked at the tumor, but if we look at, at the, the T or the CAR T cells, we can also see a strong difference. Um, we can see that the T cells, although some of them are recruited, they stay on the outside. They don't really um, attach the, attack the um, tumor spheroid. If they're individual tumor cells, they will attack, but the big spheroid, they don't really attack. There is, there's a, a zone around it where the T cells don't go. In the case of the CAR T cells, you can see they really stay on the tumor. They get into the tumor. Um, and that's something you can also see in vivo, where you have a T cell exclusion zone in many of the tumor types. Um, as we also heard yesterday, T CAR T cell treatment, it's, um, it's a rather uncontrolled treatment. If you want to have a control, you have to combine it with other um, uh, therapies. So that's what we also did. So we used um, to control the anti-tumor activity. Because in, in the end, uh, one of the issues of CAR T cells is that the efficacy and the safety um, are basically the same, the same mechanism. So you, you, you want the CAR T cells to attack, but you don't want them to attack such that um, it basically kills the entire human. Um, so you don't want the cytokine release to be um, uh, leading to a cytokine release syndrome. Okay, so um, what, what we did, we, we treated with um, desertinib, um, and um, we did that at two different stages. First, at the beginning of the CAR T cell perfusion, and um, or second at one day after um, when, we, when we stopped the CAR T cell perfusion. And if we did it from the beginning, we could see that we um, really reversed the, 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 the effect that the CAR T cells behave more like the T cells. But if we do it in an intermediate uh, at day one, we can actually um, start to control the, the um, efficacy of the, of the CAR T cells. And now we are looking into that in, in more detail also on what it means for the cytokine release. Because for the cytokine release, we can actually see um, uh, an interesting effect. Um, so what we do, we typically perfuse the CAR T cells or the T cells for 24 hours. Um, but then we can monitor the system for another week. Um, and, and that's what we did here. So we perfused the T and the CAR T cells for 24 hours. And then we um, cultured it for one week and analyzed the, the, the cytokine levels in um, the in the effluent, and we could actually mimic, in the case of the CAR T cells, um, clinically relevant cytokine levels in our effluent um, that um, uh, are, are similar to what you could uh, would you expect in, this, uh, in the case of cytokine release syndrome. So we're now trying to use um, uh, intervention strategies to modulate these, these, um, these kinetics. All right, so these are three of the, the models we have um, where we integrate immune cells. Um, and um, for the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about um, a, a little bit of a different aspect because we heard a lot about uh, that we need an automation, that we need scaling, and especially if you're interested in immune system. Um, because you have so much heterogeneity, so, so much variability, you will need scaling. You will need to look at different patients. Um, and um, one of the approaches we have for that, so we work on automation and um, increase of throughput approaches, um, and one of the approaches we have for that is um, what we call our organ-on-a-disc technology. Um, the organ-on-a-disc disc technology combines um, the concept of centrifugal microfluidics and of organ-on-a-chip models. And it looks like that. So we work with um, polymer-shaped disks, um, or disk-shaped polymers. <laughs> um, and um, these polymer modules have uh, cell channels. They have um, tissue channels, uh, media channels. They have membranes. The cell channels and the media channels run radially from the inside to the outside. The cell channels have tissue chambers at the end. And the tissue chambers and the media channels sandwich the membrane in between. So they're fluidically connected. And what this shape allows us is we can now um, just pipe a cell suspension into the central inlets of this disk. Um, and we can do that in all of the inlets at the same time using a pipette robot, for example. And then we put the disk in a, in a CD player, press play. And what happens is due to the centrifugal forces, all of the cells are being transported to the outside into the tissue chambers and form a dense 3D tissue out there. And this allows us to generate lots of uh, um, 3D tissues at the same time without any manual handling. What it also allows us is to use the same concept for media perfusion. So we add a reservoir to the center where we put fresh media, and then we add raised reservoirs on the outside, and then we start a slow rotation of the disk. And thereby we drive the media from the inside through the media channels to the outside and perfuse all of the tissues at the same time, again, without the need of any external pump. And last but not least, the symmetry of the system also allows us to use just one readout, one microscope, or one optical fiber, or whatever, to, and then sequentially or stepwise rotate the disk and look at all of the individual tissues, one after each other, just with one readout. 
So that's the concept. Um, this is how these disks look like. We use thermoplastic disk in this case. You don't want to use um, an, any elastic material if you spin it uh, strongly. Um, and then we can um, load um, the, uh, the cells into any type of chamber geometry. These are our cardiac chamber of our hardware chip system, for example, where we generate um, dense um, pellets, and we can do that in a parallelized way. We can also control the forces very precisely so that it doesn't kill the cells. Um, and then we, in this case, we, for example, can generate um, fiber-like structures, which is for our cardiac tissues uh, essential. The other um, advantage of having a, of, of a centrifugal approach is that um, even if the chamber is half filled, you can fill another batch of cells. And what that allows us is to also do sequential loading. So we can um, load one cell type and then another cell type and then the next cell type and thereby generate stratified tissues. All right. So the media channels which are on top can then also be lined with endothelial cells. So we again mimic the, the, the vasculature. Um, and then we can use this system um, and uh, similar to all of the other systems we have. The um, perfusion also works nicely, so this is one of these um, of, the, uh, of the reservoirs. Um, you add it on top, and then um, using uh, rotation speeds that are well below, or uh, centrifugal accelerations that are well below 1G, we can get the flow rates that we typically use in our, our system. One of the disadvantages of this approach is you can only do a, a linear perfusion. You perfuse from the center to the outside. You can't really circ recirculate. You can take the media using a liquid handling robot and pipe it back. But we actually came up with another approach, because the circular geometry um, also allows us to now um, add a pump layer into the center. And this pump layer is made of a, a thermoplastic elastomer. Um, and then we add a reservoir on top. And we add steel um, beads uh, on top of this uh, pump layer, which has uh, circular um, channels. And then we add uh, a magnet underneath. And now we don't rotate the disk. We keep the disk um, steady. And we rotate the, the magnet underneath the disk. And thereby, we pull the media from the reservoir, perfuse it into the channel, and then back into the reservoir. And this also allows us to, um, to ramp up the, the um, uh, flow rates in a, in a, um, a very wide range. We use that system, for example, to look at the um, response of endothelium to stimulation. Here we use TNF-alpha stimulation. But we also use this system um, to perfuse whole blood. So we uh, endothelialized our channels. And then we added, instead of um, a cell culture media, we did that in collaboration with Andreas van der Meer. Um, we added a whole blood in the system. And now we could perfuse that with our um, um, disk pump um, and look, for example, at a, at a platelet adhesion. So this is a, a platform technology which can allow it really to scale up and to, to um, uh, look at uh, lo lots of different patients. Um, and we're moving uh, a number of our, our models now onto this platform. All right, with that, I'm at the end. Um, I need to thank the entire team that does all that work. Um, I usually just travel around and have, uh, have dinners, and they do all the work in the, in the lab. So they are the heroes doing all of that, and I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>